Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. In this web week episode, Lighting in Atlantis. Atlantis Studio 5 for Win is a powerful, easy to use 3D rendering application developed especially for architects and designers. Presenting this webinar is Chris Stringer, a technical consultant for Advent. Trained as an architect, Chris has been involved in architectural software training and support since 1996. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novetch. Novetch is one of the largest online design software stores. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our Novetch webpage at www.novetch.com. And when you visit us, check out the Gimme 5 upgrade promotion. Upgrade now from Atlantis Render and Studio and take advantage of the incredible promotional prices. It's really convenient to go from 1 to 3 all the way to 5. You must provide proof of your old Atlantis Render license. And this, remember, this offer is valid till this Sunday, June 15th. And this is the um, Atlantis webpage where um, they feature the same offer. Have you been on the Novetch blog lately? The Novetch blog is a great resource to keep up with the latest software updates and where you can enjoy inspiring interviews of today's innovators. And for daily news and promos, follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Google+. Join our network and you won't miss another special or another Novetch webinar ever again. Coming up next week, from model to rendering with Rhino and V-Ray. During the webinar, one of, one of Novage's favorite Rhino instructor, Maya Mirab Holtzman, will demonstrate how to model a full-face motorcycle helmet with Rhino 5. After that, Maya will also show attendees how to obtain highly professional rendering results using V-Ray 2.0. It's a double software webinar that Maya is competent enough to attempt. Do not miss it. Last but not least, today's presentation is free and is being recorded live. If you want to rewatch this or any webinar episode, you can find it on, on our YouTube and Vimeo channel. Just search for Novet. And now, Chris, I think it's uh, time to give you the stage. And um, so if you're ready, I will say uh, lighting in Atlantis, camera and action. Okay. All right. All right. So the first test, do you see what I see? If you do, tell me what it is. Uh, Should be a series of light bulbs sitting on a table. Are we on the same page? I don't think so. Hold on. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let me try something. Let me try one thing here. Uh, now, you are the present. There it is. There you go. Okay. Beautiful. All right. We got past that little snag. So, uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Stringer, and I'm going to be presenting this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, uh, the uh, topic of lighting in Artlantis 5. Uh, I've been uh, <clears throat> with Advent for about the past 10 years, and uh, been working with them as a technical consultant uh, since last October. Prior to that, I was uh, managing Objects Online, which was the U.S. distributor of Artlantis, and I did that for about seven or eight years. So um, I think I've been an Artlantis user for uh, getting close to 20 years now, and uh, I've always loved it. It's been, I think, a very easy uh, rendering software package to use, uh, for certainly for my needs, which uh, I was trained as an architect, and that, that's my area of focus. Um, so uh, I'm not going to waste too much time with uh, you know, formal introductions. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And let's jump straight into Smart Mass and, uh, and get started with things. So I'm going to pull Atlantis up here and get my 2D window in front of me. And I'll just tell you what we're going to talk about today, kind of break down uh, the topics uh, a little bit. So we're going to cover environmental lighting in Atlantis. So that would be basically anything outside, uh, your uh, sun lighting, uh, your environmental lighting, which might include HDRI um, image backgrounds. Um, also, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to talk uh, shift gears and go into artificial lights. That would include uh, your standard uh, light sources, uh, direct point lights, things like that, uh, spotlights, 
as well as neon shaders for specialized uh, lighting applications. And then uh, finally, I'll wrap up the main portion of the presentation with uh, a few topics, some advanced features uh, going into tone mapping, automatic light adjustment, physical camera. So we'll kind of break down some of those aspects of Artlantis and show you how to uh, get a little bit more out of your renderings with some of these advanced features. And then at the end, uh, I'll give you a little eye candy. We'll go through a short uh, gallery of some user uh, creations, some user submissions on the Artlantis gallery imagery that uh, people have created using Artlantis. And I'll wrap things up with a quick uh, animation which features some of the new and uh, existing uh, features of lighting in Artlantis all sort of wrapped up in one little entertaining short animation. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, so environmental lighting in Artlantis, uh, there are uh, basically two ways of doing it now in Artlantis. The main one, the mainstay, the one that's been around for a while, is the Heliodon. Heliodon just basically stands for the sun settings in Artlantis. That's Artlantis' uh, uh, sun modeling tool. Um, and so that's, that's really usually where you're going to begin when you're dealing with the issue of environmental lighting in Artlantis. So um, we can access the Heliodon by uh, clicking on the Heliodon inspector. You can go up to the inspector menu and do it. Or you can click on this black menu, which is sort of the, the new standard interface for Atlantis. And that'll take you into a new uh, dialog here at the top. These are the settings for the Heliodon tool that appear in this dark gray palette. <clears throat> and then in, in the palette on the left, we're seeing a list of the actual Heliodons or suns that have been set up uh, for, this for this project. Now, you're going to have to bear with me today. I'm uh, kind of recovering from a cold, so I may have to <laughs> take a break every now and then for a sip of water. I'm still uh, on the mend a little bit. So um, anyway, so on the list on the left are the, uh, the, the list of the Heliodons that are set up, and then the, the Heliodon that is active for the current 3D view that we're looking at, the current 3D camera, is going to show up highlighted in white. So this day camera that I've set up, or this day sun that I've set up, <coughs> set up excuse me, is uh, the one that's being used in this view. So if you don't see this palette on the side, it probably means you just need to click this little tab here. It's, it might be hard to see on your screen. You kind of have to get close to see it. But it's a little tab with a bunch of little dots. It sort of looks like a Band-Aid. And if you click on that, um, it'll flip that side um, tab open. There's also one at the bottom for uh, media and the timeline, but we won't be dealing with those so much today in our minutes. So um, we've got our list in front of us. And uh, each Heliodon, as you can see, has its own or can have its own unique name. Usually you want to name it something mean meaningful so you know, remember what it is and what it's supposed to do. And uh, so it's possible to set up a range of different sun settings. And uh, with those sun settings, geographic locations are tied to those sun settings. So you can create basically a host of different uh, environmental conditions for your model. Um, so the Heliodon that's active for the current camera, as I said, is going to have this white text. So we're dealing with this, this day camera here. And uh, if the Heliodon is used in more than one view, you can flip open this little triangle next to the Heliodons and see which cameras, those are camera names listed under each heliodon, are using that specific heliodon or that specific sun setting. So that's a way to keep track of uh, your cameras and, and which suns they're using. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's move on uh, and, and start breaking down the topics uh, or the, uh, the settings here uh, that are available for, this, uh, for these heliodon settings. So we're dealing here on the left with several different types of heliodons. We're going to start with the city-based Heliodon. This is based on a, a real town and a real time and date. And then those sliders appear, or those options appear, right next to that radio button, which we have selected. So um, we can adjust the slider here and choose a different date and time to whatever we want, really. We can also choose a different time of day by adjusting the slider. And it's uh, probably also worth mentioning that you can also type in numerical values if you want to key in a specific time or a spe specific date that way. And then you have this pull-down list of cities. 
that you can go through. These are cities all over the world. Most of the major cities are listed. <coughs> Excuse me. But if your city isn't listed, you can click on this edit button here and it will pull up some additional options where you can add additional cities or delete cities that are in the list so you have a way of managing your cities to uh, drill down and get uh, additional locations set up. So that's on oh, instantly uh, on the right there is the north direction so each uh, when you're setting, setting these up you can uh, input a north arrow so you can basically orient your project uh, based on you know what is the appropriate uh, direction vector there and you can also click on the daylight savings time if that's important to your location and the time of year that you're dealing with. If I don't lose my voice, so um, <clears throat> by you know setting these exact locations and uh, dates, uh, we have the ability to really hone in on a specific uh, specific. A range of specific different um, settings, whatever we like, you know, with the Heliodon. Um, so moving on, we can also uh, go through these sliders here, and uh, we can uh, tweak, uh, for example, the shadows. So there's a checkbox here <coughs> that you can click to turn shadows on or off and you can see the instant results in the 3D preview window as I do that. And if we want to, we can adjust the, the softness of the edge of the shadows by um, adjusting the slider here. So the more we slide it to the right, the softer the edges get. And the more we slide it to the left, the more hard edged <coughs> those uh, shadows get. I'm <laughs> afraid my voice is going to fail me. So um, that is, uh, th those are some of the basic uh, parameters that you can set up for uh, the sun, some of the most basic parameters. And then you can get into the sun and the sky sliders, which give you kind of the ability to tweak the levels of the sun lighting uh, as they exist in the project or in the model, as you're seeing them in the 3D preview window. Because this 3D preview window, if you're not familiar with our Atlantis, is really geared to show you exactly what you're going to get uh, in terms of finished output from Artlantis. So it's about as true as it can get to the finished product to give you real-time feedback as you're tweaking your model and making changes to all these different parameters that you have access to. So if we bump the uh, sun slider up, for example, <coughs> you're going to see that the what's taking direct sun in Artlantis is brightening. So that slider controls basically the first hit of sunlight in the 3D model. And you'll notice this little red dot appears as we've adjusted the parameter up or down and either brightened or darkened uh, the direct sunlight. That red dot appears. And so if we ever want to return quickly back to what are the default settings for the sunlight, we just click on that red dot and it zeroes it out back to the, the center portion. That doesn't mean the light goes away. It just simply means that uh, you're kind of reset to the default uh, setting for the sunlight. Same thing for the skylight. And the skylight <coughs> is basically referring to the ambient light in the project. So as we bump that up, you can see here, for example, on the shaded side of the model, the uh, ambient light increases as we adjust that slider and decreases as we drop it down. I don't know how choppy that is on your end, but I'll give it a few seconds to refresh. So there's, you can see the effects of those two sliders and what they do to the scene. Now we can also click on the uh, color uh, palette here next to the sun, and if we want to, we can dial up uh, a color uh, specific to the sunlight, and that will start to <coughs> impact the coloration of the scene. You can see, for example, if I dial up this yellow color, we're basically creating a yellow cast over the project. And if I continue to go with that, then we're really baking people here. Um, same thing for the skylighting, and you'll often see this in uh, CGI movies. They'll actually have sort of a bluish uh, tint to the skylight, uh, so we can pull that up in much the same way. So your uh, ambient lighting, as we increase that, uh, what's in shade starts to take on that bluish cast, uh, which you can kind of notice 
happening here under the uh, under the chairs, under the seats. So that's um, a way to, to control those two uh, aspects of the lighting in the, the Heliodon. <coughs> uh, moving on, we can add or delete sun. So what, whatever we have currently selected, if we click this uh, little Heliodon button with the plus next to it, we can add an exact duplicate of that uh, Heliodon. And if we want to make that the active uh, Heliodon in the view, then we go ahead and right click and activate for current view. And now that new Heliodon we've just created becomes the new uh, active sun for this view. And if we make some, you know, some basic changes, you can see that there's going to be a difference here between that sun now and uh, the previous sun that we were using. So we've got a nighttime sun, uh, <coughs> which if this preview catches up and refreshes, you'll see uh, it's building the scene. Uh, if we switch back to the day camera, the original day camera, uh, we're back to that daylit view. And then you can also select uh, your uh, Heliodon or Suns in this list and click the minus button to remove them. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to generate uh, a manual sun setting. So to do that, we're going to duplicate this sun here and click on it and we'll call it manual one. And we're going to change uh, the setting to the, the secondary uh, setting here with the hand, which means you're going to go in and start creating uh, some specific uh, changes to the sun that don't have anything to do with geography as much as they have to do with where you want the sun to be placed in the sky. So you can see the geography and the date and time have disappeared and have been replaced by azimuth values, um, which is you know, basically a point on a compass. Uh, uh, or a, po a point around you, oriented around you, and then elevation values. So if we swing this uh, azimuth around graphically here, we should notice that the sun is going to move in the sky. Of course, we have to activate this view, so let me go ahead and do that. So now the manual camera we just set up is active, and as we adjust <coughs> the uh, position, the azimuth of the sun, you can see how the sun is the effect of the sun is now changing as we drag that around the project. So the project is basically located in the center of you know, the, the circle, and then the sun is around it. And we can also see that feedback real time <coughs> in the 2D preview window. So uh, we can, <coughs> for example, uh, if we get the elevation of the sun low enough, uh, you're actually going to see a little icon represented here for the sun. Once we see that icon, we can actually grab this sun and then start to manually drag it in the sky with our mouse, with our mouse button. <coughs> and as you can see, just like if we were to you know, set up a sunset uh, using the uh, city type of heliodon, you know, choosing a geographic location and setting a time of day, uh, as the sun gets lower in the at atmosphere, uh, it starts to interact with the you know, particles that are you know exist in the atmosphere, and the light starts to bend in different ways, and the wavelengths change to different colors. So as we uh, we can use this pollution slider to enhance that effect. So as we increase the amount of pollution uh, uh, in the sky, quote unquote pollution, what it's doing then is is adjusting the uh, coloration of the sun as it you know, draws closer to the horizon and gets, uh, gets close to that horizon line there. And so if we uh, move the sun up here, uh, <coughs> in a second I'll talk about some other things we can do. Um, so let's switch. Uh, there's one additional parameter that uh, you can already see in this view, and I'm going to highlight it. It's the clouds. So currently the cloud setting is checked. And if we uncheck that, you're going to see the clouds disappear, and you're just left with a simple sky <coughs> that, uh, under normal daylighting conditions, daytime conditions, is nice and bright blue. And as you get toward the sunset, again, it's still going to change to uh, match whatever the sun is doing. If we turn that back on and pull up the cloud settings, we can see there are a range of four different styles of clouds that we have available to us. Um, and I'll just drop these all down to zero so you get a real quick feel for what each one does. So cirrus clouds are sort of high-level or mid-level clouds. And you can dial up the um, 
density of those clouds from very dense scenario to uh, just light wispy clouds. Uh, the stratus clouds are a little bit um, heavier clouds. Those are, you know, kind of cold, cold weather, cloudy day clouds you might be used to seeing, especially if you're from where I'm from, which is Akron, Ohio, Northeast Ohio, where it seemed like every day in winter this is what you saw. Um, and then uh, we've got cumulus clouds, which are the typical cotton ball clouds that uh, most of us are used to staring at on a summer day and trying to imagine what shapes they uh, turn into. And then your cirrocumulus which are sort of your high altitude clouds that uh, create sort of a banded appearance uh, to them. And then click on the seed button, <coughs> which cycles through different, uh, basically different randomized uh, starting points for those clouds. So if we pull up, let's say, a combination of uh, some of these clouds and kind of blend them together a little bit and change the seed value, you can see um, uh, how that uh, plays itself out with the different cloud types showing up in there. Uh, and then finally you have this checkbox here to, to mask, uh, to have the clouds mask the sun so we can turn that on or off and, and if a cloud happens to be obstructing the sun <coughs> then the shading or the shadows from the sun will uh, be cast on the project because the cloud is blocking the sun. So once we're satisfied with the cloud settings we can click OK and uh, so that's kind of a basic run through of, of the manual uh, sun setting and what that does. And then, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I mentioned that you, you have the, the sort of the automatic sunlight changing as the sun gets near the horizon. Um, we talked about uh, how we can change the sky color uh, through, uh, you know, by dropping the sun, but there's another way you can change the sky color too if you, you're not quite happy with uh, what you've got uh, by default. So you can go in here to this checkbox and mix a color into the sky. So if we just use pure white, it just basically brightens the sky. Uh, but let's say we wanted maybe a, a little bit more of an orange cast to the sky <coughs> because we're looking for some kind of Tahitian or Hawaiian sunset. So we can pull, pull that up. Um, by adjusting the slider here and mixing that in with um, the sky color that we've got here. So in that way you can kind of customize the appearance of the sky if you're trying to achieve a certain effect. So um, moving on, let's, let's, I'm going to turn off the, uh, the sky color because that's a little bit of a distraction. I'm going to talk about um, a few more uh, special special effects with um, the sun settings. One of them is, uh, I'll get the sun up here high enough so that you can hopefully see this effect play itself out. Um, one of them is lens flare. So if you're not familiar with what lens flare is, it's basically a, <coughs> a natural effect that happens, a photographic effect that happens when the camera is facing the sun and you get these sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, rainbow-like uh, artifacts or halos or rings that appear across the image. And so Artlantis is able to add those kinds of effects. This is, this is an effect you can get in Photoshop, but Artlantis uh, has this effect also built in so you can actually skip the trip to Photoshop and just uh, uh, apply the setting to the sun itself. And once the, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see this little red dot down here in the corner, when that's showing, that means that the preview window is still working on regenerating itself. When that dot changes to green, that means that the 3D preview window is done generating. Now, um, lens flare is a post-process effect, so it's one of the last things that's going to show up. You know, it just showed up now. It's one of the last things that's going to show up when the preview window is regenerating. So you can see now these dots uh, that are drawn across here. That's the lens flare happening um, in real, you know, I want to say real time, it's happening in the real time 3D preview window, but it is the last thing to show up on, on the uh, screen redraw. I'm going to turn that off and talk about one other um, type of, uh, uh, let's say, feature, uh, and that is the sunbeam, um, which is kind of a volumetric lighting effect <coughs> that mimics another real world phenomenon. If you're used to uh, 
let's say a cloudy day, you're looking up and seeing the sun, usually in the late afternoon or getting towards evening, as the sun peaks through the clouds, oftentimes it uh, will create a, kind of a, I want to say a, a, a ray, you, know, you can see visible rays of light projecting <clears throat> through the gaps in the clouds or through the gaps in the leaves of a tree. And so that's what the uh, sunbeam uh, checkbox does for you. When your sun is in a position like that and your camera happens to be facing the sun, <clears throat> if you turn on the sunbeam, then you will see this effect uh, on the screen. And uh, as we wait for the screen to redraw again, uh, it'll take a minute here. I don't exactly have the fastest computer in the world. My computer is several years old, but even my old, old clunker can still uh, use our Atlantis. And so what you see here, uh, when this uh, red, drop, red dot turns green, you'll see the rays shooting across uh, through the clouds and through the trees and, and over the edge of the building and creating uh, these visible uh, light artifacts in the scene. So in probably just a few seconds, that should happen. Um, so, and, and we've got the slider turned way up, so it's a little extreme. Um, but if you tone it down to somewhere, usually in the, let's say, 20 to 30 range, <coughs> you're going to end up uh, with something pretty reasonable. Uh, and it does kind of depend on the overall brightness of your scene to begin with. So you might need to play with that slider a little bit to dial up something that's going to be appropriate. But you don't have to render this thing out to see it happen. You can just uh, adjust the slider there so we can see this a little better look at those rays of light you can see coming through the building and shooting up past the trees. So I'll turn that effect off. And we're going to uh, touch on one other little quick point here. And that uh, hopefully you can see this is the animation um, uh, tab here where we can activate the wind power, the wind direction, and what that affects are the clouds in the sky. So if we activate the wind and give it some uh, power setting, anything really above zero is going to get those clouds moving when you generate an animation. And then we can also swing this uh, vector around on this little compass to give the clouds a certain direction that they're going to be moving in. And so if we click OK, if we generate an animation, the clouds are going to be moving in that animation. So that's the perfect thing to do if you're going to create a sun study. So not only can you have the sunlight uh, or the sun moving through the sky in, a, in the sun study animation in Atlantis, but you can also have the clouds moving right along with the sun and doing what clouds do in the normal course of the day. <coughs> I'm going to go on to the next uh, type of sun, uh, and I'll just take this manual sun and duplicate it. And, uh, and let's get the sun, uh, actually it doesn't really matter what it's doing, because we're going to switch it, uh, we're going to change the name of this to 45. And this is going to be uh, the next type of heliodon or sun type that we have in our NAS that we have access to, <coughs> which is the 45 degree sun. This is most typically used for um, the parallel views in Artlantis. Parallel views in Artlantis, if you're not familiar, are um, basically uh, uh, axonometric type views, so uh, standard elevation type views, or axons, or plan views, those kinds of things where there is no perspective. So I, I have this parallel view set up. And so what the 45 degree suns does, if we go back to the heliodons here for a second and pull up our new sun and make that active for this current view, is it, uh, no matter where uh, the <coughs> parallel view is facing, and this is our, basically, the camera settings for a parallel view, so you can see I can move this around and, and adjust the, you know, where the building is. Uh, I can widen this to show more of the building in the context of the site if I want to where I can shrink it down and really just focus in on the building. So this would be useful, of course, for uh, if you're doing any sort of uh, drawings that maybe are being submitted for an architectural review board or some local planning office, and they may want to see you know, what the elevation looks like. This is an easy way to do that. And so the 45 degree sun ties in with that. So no matter where you aim your, uh, your camera, you can see that the sun remains at a 45 degree angle, and the angles are going to cut across the facade at a 45 degree. 
So that is what that uh, sun type is about. Um, so that pretty much covers uh, what you can do with the sun or the heliodon in Artlantis. Uh, let's change gears and talk about another type of um, uh, option for uh, lighting in Artlantis. I'm going to switch back to my perspective views for a second. And I'm going to go into this HDRI uh, image that I have set up. And in a second, that'll come up. So um, there, you can, there are several different types of backgrounds you can set up in Artlantis by clicking on this little tab here, this little thumbnail preview. I can pull up uh, a dialog for setting the background. So we can set up 2D images or 3D images, which would basically be a wraparound image. And then there's a special type of wraparound image if you're not familiar with it, called HDR, which just stands for High Dynamic Range Image. Um, and this is a range of uh, basically bracketed photos uh, shot on a tripod uh, that are normally a 360 degree wraparound uh, sort of fisheye uh, view of the entire surrounding site with light information from those different brackets uh, embedded into the HDRI. So there's a couple of exciting benefits in using a background like this. I'm going to, uh, just to show you what was there before, I'm going to delete this. So we just had a plain vanilla sky in Atlantis to start with. And then uh, to add an HDRI image, I just double click this tab here, or I can open up a window in my uh, hard drive and drag and drop an HDRI image into this uh, this uh, thumbnail here. I'm going to double click this <coughs> particular HDRI image that I have. I have several lined up from this one developer. And uh, so when that comes in, you're going to see that uh, wraparound um, HDR image um, created, you know, being used as the background. And so uh, not only is it, does it create this immersive environment, but it also can be used to light the scene. So if you click this uh, checkbox here to turn on HDRI lighting, then it's going to light the scene. I'm going to turn that on. And what I'm going to do is turn off the, uh, this uh, particular heliodon, which happens to be called the HDRI, just so you can see the difference. So there's no heliodon on. We're just getting lighting in this environment from the HDRI image, which is checked here. So if I go back into that uh, background uh, dialog for a second, <coughs> turn off the HDRI lighting, you can see, of course, there's no environmental lighting happening. Uh, and then when I turn that back on, this is just the lighting effects, the ambient lighting effects when uh, the screen redraws that are coming in from the HDRI uh, background image that's being used. And so it'll take a second for that to refresh itself on my screen. Uh, it might even come in a little overexposed, but eventually it'll correct itself and balance itself out. And uh, then you'll see the... Uh, what we saw a few minutes ago with the uh, that ambient lighting coming in off of the, uh, the background. And, the, and the, uh, the important thing to note about these HDR images is that these are accurate. I mean, these are accurate to the surroundings. They're coming from the surroundings. So uh, every nuance of this ambient lighting that's bouncing around in your project is coming, uh, you know, matching the true colors of the environment that surrounds it in this wraparound environment. And as that's refreshing itself, there is a slider here. I'm not going to touch it because I'm going to allow this to continue redrawing. I don't want to, to go through any more changes here. We can adjust the slider here uh, to adjust the power of the lighting for the HDRI image. So if we needed it brighter, we could do that. We could tweak that here. Uh, if we needed it darker, we could tweak it here. And again, uh, we've got that little dot in the middle that will reset it to the sort of the average value that's, uh, that's suggested here. I'm going to click OK on this. Uh, oh, one other thing to mention, too, is you can also adjust um, the brightness of the image itself using this slider here. So if the image is too washed out or it's too bright, then you can go in and tweak that as well. So I guess I don't have to be afraid of using these sliders. They do work. Um, so you can adjust these sliders real time and see uh, the effects happen. Click on those red dots to reset them. And you can also tweak the X and Y values if you need to position the uh, site a little higher or a little lower. 
than what it happens to be at the current moment. You can do that. So you can see by um, adding a, a value here, I was able to drop the site down a little bit and get the horizon line a little closer to what I perceive the horizon line to be at, which is pretty close to where that uh, edge of that overhang is, or that eave there. So <clears throat> I'll click OK on that. So that's how HDRI works in Artlantis. Now, one thing you'll notice, uh, by just using the HDRI uh, image lighting as a light source in Artlantis, uh, you'll notice that we don't have any shadows coming in. And the only way to make that happen, since HDRI really is just an ambient light source, we have to use uh, the HDRI image in combination with uh, a sun, or a regular heliodon in Artlantis. And that heliodon will add the shading uh, on the 3D objects in the scene, so that we have a combination of some uh, realistic uh, ambient lighting coming in from the HDRI and uh, some realistic shadows uh, playing off of the 3D objects in the scene coming in from the art and sun. So that's how those two things can be used in combination to uh, accomplish that effect. Um, and that, I think, pretty much concludes the sun, uh, the discussion of the sun in Artlantis. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about standard lights in Artlantis. And I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit if I can. So I'm in this scene here uh, showing the standard lights in Artlantis. Uh, we've got a nighttime sun set up, as you can see up here, and no artificial lights set up in this scene. So we're going to go in and add uh, some light sources to this scene. So I'm going to switch to my lights menu, which is different. It's a different menu in Atlantis uh, dedicated for artificial lighting. And I'm going to add a new light. First, I'm going to add a new light group. And I'm going to call this bar lighting one. I already had a light group set up called that, so uh, it's just going to automatically default to that name as I duplicate that group. And then I'm going to take a light <coughs> and uh, Actually, I won't select the light. I'm just going to add a new light in here. So if we click the single uh, light bulb icon with the plus next to it, that's how you add a single individual light bulb. If I pull up the plan view, you'll see that it places the light, that little orange dot there on the plan on the right, exactly where the camera also happens, happens to be located. So if you don't have a light an existing light already pre-selected when you add a new light source to your view, then it's just going to place it wherever the camera is, and then you can go into the plan view and drop that camera, or drop that light wherever you want it to be. Now, uh, it's probably a little hard to see right now in the preview window, but we've got basically a bar set up in this kitchen. This is the plan view we're looking at, and these are several uh, hanging light uh, fixtures over the bar, and then there's some seating to the right of that. So I'm going to try to line up this uh, light source in the center of one of those uh, light fixtures. I'm, maybe I'll do this one. I'm going to have to back out of here a little bit to shorten the light a little bit. So it's a little more manageable, a little easier to work with. And we'll zoom back in here. And uh, so I'm going to start uh, locking the, the, the movements. The top of this light is here on the right. The bottom is here on the left. I know that because I can look at it in the 3D window and see that. And then if I uh, switch to a frontal elevation view, <coughs> I can zoom in on this light, swing it down, and make it basically a down light uh, ready to, uh, to go into this lighting fixture. So I'm going to um, switch to a side view and zoom in to the side and have a look at where we are. So we're pretty close to where we need to be. I'm going to move this over into this um, uh, lamp on the left and zoom into that. So there's my light source and it's pretty well centered in that uh, fixture already, just about where I want it. <clears throat> I'll switch back to the frontal view and confirm that I am in fact centered in the lights that are by the bar and I'm not, so I need to slide that over. So I can start the drag and then hold the shift key down, and that's going to lock my movement in 45 degree increments, so I can get, uh, get it pretty well centered into that uh, fixture there, and I can zoom in further if I want to tweak it. And that's pretty good. So once I'm happy with that, then um, I can uh, 
go through and start tweaking some of the settings. So I want to, you know, ultimately I want to end up with three of these, but first I want to kind of go through and adjust these lights and get them looking the way I want to. First thing you're going to notice here is that um, the angle of the light is a little too shallow. Uh, we really want the light to more or less, the cone, the light cone, to hit right about at that corner there of the light because <clears throat> that's where the light's going to spill out from, from this uh, straight line point here uh, from the source to the, the lampshade. So I'm going to adjust the slider here until I my yellow lines, which hopefully you can see on your screen, are just about hitting that corner there. And that's a good spot. So now that light is pretty much you know, what it would look like. Now I could use a, that's an 83 degree angle there. I could use a 360 degree light if I wanted to. And that would work because it is going to shade, you know, the lampshade is actually going to block the light from coming out, you know, spilling out uh, from the lampshade. So it's mostly going to focus out of the light coming from the bottom. But if you adjust the shadow to some level of softness, you may end up with some artifacts, some light bleed happening. Now this isn't done regenerating, so the light bleed isn't that bad. It's going to refresh and there may be a, a very faint hint of some light bleed happening. Probably not enough to really be noticeable. Um, so in order to kind of counteract that, instead of using a point light or a 360 degree angle, which would be the equivalent of a light bulb, the bare light bulb, <coughs> we can adjust the angle down uh, to an appropriate uh, angle for whatever downlight we're trying to, to set up here. And again, we know this is 83 because we just called that value up. And that'll basically force the light just to fit within that cone and, and go where we want it to. Now we can also adjust some other parameters. The uh, lights uh, can be turned, first of all, turned on or off using this checkbox here. That's pretty important to know. Um, and there's several other ways of basically turning lights on or off or let's say making them not visible in the scene. Another way is to actually change the color of the light source itself to black. When you do that, the light disappears. Uh, <clears throat> normally I would just suggest using a white color or some, somewhere, let's say, from 50% or higher for your light color. Uh, it can be, of course, it doesn't have to be white. You can add some saturation and you can actually tint this to you know, whatever sort of color you want. If you want a cool light, um, you could you know, adjust the hue, the hue a little bit to give you sort of a cool uh, color temperature if you want to. Or you can switch to a warmer edge of the spectrum. Um, so once you're satisfied with the light color, uh, then you go and adjust the light value. This slider here or this number next to it is how you adjust the power of the light down. So I'd say 500 is a little bit too extreme for what we're going for. Probably somewhere around 75 or maybe 100 is going to be appropriate <coughs> for what we're looking at here. Again, since we're duplicating this down in a row, there's going to be a kind of a cumulative effect happening with the lights. Uh, attenuation is a way of um, uh, basically taking the light power and extending it out. So instead of the light being, let's say, full 75 here, and then by the time the light is, let's say, five feet down, it's dissipated to the, where the power hitting the chair is probably, I don't know, somewhere around 30. Uh, and of course, the further out you go, it dissipates even more. Um, <clears throat> we can add this attenuation value. So if I attenuate this to, let's say, a distance of five feet, the effect that has on the light is it reduces the power of the light. And so you should see a dimming effect happening on the light. If I extend the attenuation even more, you'll see it's more pronounced. And if I keep going with it, maybe set it to 20, the higher the value, the, the more diminished the light power gets because it's basically using whatever the power is out of 20 feet. That's the new kind of power that's happening up at the, at the, the light source and projecting out from there. That's the, the basic end of net effect of what you're getting when you use attenuation. I'm going to turn that off because we, want, we really don't want the light to be dampened at all. Um, another thing uh, we can talk about is, uh, well, we talked about the angle, we talked about the shadow. Um, there are lighting profiles. Um, by default, we use this uh, light profile here uh, in the lower left, but there are uh, nine uh, a total of nine different lighting profiles you can call up to change the quality of the light. And these do have, a, a, to some extent, a certain dimming effect on the lights. <clears throat> so you can play with those. 
they become more noticeable as you get a light closer to a wall. So uh, we'll choose one like this just for the heck of it. You can see how the, the light ring plays on the floor, and then we'll see what happens when it hits the wall there in a minute. And uh, hide these for a second. All right, so we'll go back to the light here, and uh, I think we're pretty well satisfied with what we're trying to do here with this light, so we're going to go ahead and duplicate it. I'll talk about how to do that. Um, so I'm going to go into the plan view, and I'm going to zoom in a little closer to this bar seating area. And I'm going to take this light and select it. It's already selected. And I'm going to hold the Alt key down and the Shift key. And I'm going to start dragging this light in the approximate direction I want it to go for the, for the copies. And then I'm going to let go of the Alt key and the Shift key while keeping my hand or my thumb still on the left click button on the mouse. So I'm holding the left mouse button down. I'm dragging this line to where I want the row of lights to end. Okay? So if I release the mouse, that's going to uh, basically <coughs> set that line down. It's not finished yet. It's waiting for me to hit the enter button to finalize things. Now, I want three lights, not just two lights. So right now I've got two dots. If I hit the plus button, you'll see a blue dot appear. So I'm, that adds lights. I can hit it again. And now I've got four lights. I can hit it again. I've got five lights. Now if I accidentally add too many lights, I can hit the minus uh, key and reduce those lights to the desired number I want. So that is three lights right there ready to go. Click uh, the enter key and boom, those lights are in there. And they're now exactly where I want them. And uh, We'll turn on the light cone and dial up a value for that just to show you uh, that similar to the sun settings, you can also pull up, <coughs> excuse me, you can pull up light cone settings, volumetric light settings for the artificial lights in Artlantis. And again, a little bit goes a long way unless you're in a really crowded smoky bar, bar or a, <coughs> a concert with some fog effects going on, you're not normally going to see this kind of thing going on. Um, so use that effect and use it sparingly, but it, it is nice to be able to see that if you want to just give a hint of, let's say, a little, little dusty atmosphere in the room or something like that, you can do that. Um, all right, so I don't, let's, let's turn off the light cone, <coughs> and uh, so you can see this light here on the end, you're getting a little bit of that uh, profile, uh, lighting profile happening there. Uh, we could pull this one up too and just change it, and you can see how when those lights hit the wall, uh, you, you're getting a little different feel happening with each different lighting profile. I'm going to go back to the standard lighting profiles and just pull that, pull that up. <coughs> so we talked about angle and shadow. We talked about light cone. Um, I didn't talk about the lens flare, but that's just like the sun, uh, so we can activate a lens flare. And if your camera happens to be sort of aiming near toward the light source uh, to where you would see the light source, then you're going to see the lens flare happening. I'm going to turn that off because we don't need that to calculate. Um, and then let's talk about a few more uh, 2D and 3D editing options. And I know we're starting to run short on time, so I'm going to try to speed through this as best I can. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, <laughs> when do you want me to stop? No, no, keep going. I just, uh, I know you keep also going. want to take us on a Paris tour. I know you had the video also prepared, so I don't know. Oh, but yeah, yeah. We have, um, uh, we don't have much time and we have uh, some oh, questions. Oh, don't worry about that. That, okay. that, uh, that will be probably half a minute to a minute at the most. Okay. That'll be just a little eye candy at the end. Okay. So, so um, I'll, I'll try to, try to move this, move through this in about, uh, let's say the next five minutes. Perfect. Is that enough time? Okay. All right, so uh, there are different ways we can edit lights in 2D and 3D. I'll just talk about some of the 3D options. I have these three lights selected here. And, uh, of course, I can, in, there, in the plan, I can click on them and drag them. In the settings here, I can, you know, with those three lights activated, I can change the power value if I want. Uh, so I can edit them numerically or edit the parameters here. I can edit them in the plan. I'm going to undo both of those things I just did. I can also, in the 3D window, <coughs> uh, grab this uh, 
uh, the, the end point of the light and let's say aim it at something, a target on the wall or on the floor and the uh, source of the light will remain fixed on that blue um, axis and I can also move that axis around too and keep the targets fixed on wherever they happen to be. So this is a very useful way to manipulate a group of lights without really having to think about it all that much. You can just do it visually in the 3D preview window. So those are a couple of cool things in ArtLantis that, uh, uh, especially that one which is new in ArtLantis 5. Um, I'm going to quickly mention um, light objects. Um, rather than going into the object menu, I'll just pull one up. I, I had preset some uh, wall sconce lighting in this scene, so I'm just going to call those up right now and um, activate those in this view. Um, so I'll select them. Maybe turn them on, and maybe turn on the groups too. Okay, so there's a couple of things that affect uh, <clears throat> whether you're going to see a light, and one of them is turn the lights themselves on and off. Another is to turn on or off the light group. So if you have the light source on but the group off, you're not going to see the light source. So th you know that's a little caveat. You've got to remember there are different ways of manipulating the lights, turning them on and off through groups, through color to the light source itself. So be aware of that as you're working in ArtLantis. Don't lose sight of the fact that you have those options available to you. Um, all right, so that is, those are light objects. And then I'll go into one more thing in ArtLantis here. Um, I'm going to switch my scene to uh, this neon light um, view that I have set up. And I'm going to select uh, I'm going to go to my shaders. Now, neon lights are a type of shader in Artlanta, so it's a very specialized type of light used for fluorescence or neon or specialized lighting applications where they have an irregular shape. They're not a standard point light like a you know, normal light bulb. And I'm, I can click on, when I have a shader pulled up, I can click on a, uh, I can click on a surface, and then I can activate this picker tool and choose how I want to select some surfaces, and I'm going to select by polygon and pick the polygons I want, and then I'm going to assign a copy of the selected material, and I'll just pick any old material, I'll choose a black material, and it's going to make a copy of that black material, and so that, that's going to be a new material applied to that surface. So now <clears throat> I can go to uh, the uh, shaders and, whoops, okay, and open up the shaders, and go into my options here, my regular default shaders in Artlantis, and apply a neon light to the surface that I just modified. So this is going to create the effect of a kind of a backlighting scenario. Now I'm going to switch back to the um, regular view of the bar and have a look there. And I'm going to turn off the uh, standard lighting and turn on the uh, new neon lighting that I set up and we can get, you know, with the neon lighting that's available in the shaders menu, we can tweak some options so I can, for example, uh, set up a color. So if I want to make this kind of look a little interesting, add a little interest or intrigue into the space, I can adjust the slider and uh, kind of create those effects so that bar now has sort of a <coughs> backlit appearance to it thanks to that neon lighter that I just, neon light that I just applied to the back side of that bar, a little strip running along the back edge of the bar. So um, let me uh, jump into uh, some, uh, get into the advanced topics here and then we'll wrap up here in just a couple of minutes. So um, going back to the perspectives, um, I'm going to pull up another view and uh, We'll have a look at uh, kind of an outside looking in view of the bar here on the right and then sort of a living room area for this house on the left with some additional lighting set up. Now every single camera in Artlantis, and that's what I'm looking at here, I'm in the perspectives view, and these thumbnails are the cameras, uh, can have its own independent light settings set up. So every single light group can be independently turned on or off. Uh, I can choose from, you know, between all the different suns that I've set up in my project. I can turn on the black, or I'm sorry, the neon light if I want to. And those uh, light sources <coughs> are going to appear then 
in my scene. Um, so uh, I, if you want to, uh, you can go through each of these different cameras and go through those settings and do that. Uh, another feature is this tone mapping control. And if we're not quite happy with the way the bright areas or the dark areas of the scene are looking, maybe the dark areas are too dark, I can adjust the slider and bump up the value of the dark tones a little bit. Or I can bump this slider and adjust down the values of the exposed uh, areas of the lighting. So I have the, the ability with these sliders here to tweak those uh, options in, <coughs> in the final scene. And then uh, lastly here, I'm going to talk about automatic uh, light adjustment versus the physical camera in Artlantis. So when the physical camera is checked off, that means you're dealing in the realm of the automatic light adjustment. So Artlantis automatically balances the lighting through the use of the first bounce and next bounce sliders. I'm not going to explain what those mean. It just suffices to say that if I'm in a night uh, sun and I switch to a day sun, it's automatically going to balance out all the lighting in the scene. So the sun power is so strong that it's going to basically override these light sources that are still on. You can see them in the list here. But because the sun is so powerful, it really diminishes the power of those lights. So that's what automatic light mapping does and the automatic light adjustment. So as your time of day changes, and in fact, we can take this day sun and drop it to a night sun. And as that refreshes, you can see we're back to the sun power being very low and the light power bumping back, back up and, and adjusting automatically. Now, if we go back into our perspective view and pull up the rendering parameters again, uh, we turn on the physical camera. This is a different option. So no longer do we have this automatic light adjustment happen. We can now go in and tweak our light settings. Uh, for example, we can choose this preset interior light uh, setting, which is a good place to start. And using common settings, you know, if, you're, if you've used a digital camera or a traditional camera, you're going to know what these things mean, ISO. Uh, so if I can bump up the ISO value, and uh, I'll get a little more exposure happening on the light areas. And I can just keep doing that, or I can adjust the slider until I, I reach a level that I'm happy with. And I can also adjust the shutter speed. So, you know, if we um, uh, extend the sh shutter in one direction or the other, we're capturing more light or, or not capturing as much light in the scene. So that's what uh, automatic light adjustment versus your manual or physical camera light adjustment, how that works in Artmanis. So that kind of concludes the overall uh, run through of Artmanis. I'm going to jump into a quick slideshow just to give you a taste of what some other folks have done in Artmanis. Um, so these are just some examples I thought were kind of nice that people had put in the Artmanis um, user gallery on artmanis.com. Really beautiful stuff that people have set up using just the lights in Artmanis. Even some lens flare happening on some of these light sources. So this gives you a sense of the dr dramatic effect lighting can have in Artmanis using just the natural environmental lighting and the available um, sun lighting or, you know, or, or artificial lighting uh, that options you have available. We've got a little bit of the volumetric lighting effect happening in this background here. So even the lack of lights can be can create or affect the mood. <clears throat> so it can create a somber tone. So these are pretty exquisite. And sometimes simplicity tells a lot. Just the sunlight can be enough to create a heightened sense of drama. And then finally, as promised, we're going to go on a little trip here. And hopefully you'll be able to see, or at least get an idea of what's going on in this animation. This is an animation I created of a world-famous landmark that I've been to a few times. Avon is, is headquartered in Paris, France, so I thought it might be appropriate to create an animation using some of the lighting effects available in Artlantis. <clears throat> so they happen pretty quickly in this animation. You may not have caught them all, but uh, we can see the volumetric lighting happening at the top of the animation. Also, when it gets close to sunset, 
you're seeing like a lens flare there, you're seeing some of the volumetric lighting happening on the sides of the Eiffel Tower and that sort of thing. So those things are all available to you and, and animatable in Artlantis if you're using Artlantis Studio. Now there's a difference between Artlantis Studio and Render. Render just does still images, Studio does uh, the animation uh, uh, presentations as well as still images. So with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation and open things up to some questions. So I'm sure there are a few questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Ooh la la, of course. <laughs> so I've been sending, <laughs> assigning you the questions as we went, but I, I'm mm -hmm. willing to read them to you. I don't know if you can see them. And, um, I, I can a... see, yeah, okay, I, okay. I can see. Uh, Do you want to pick and choose? I'll just go through them and pick and choose, yeah. Okay. Uh, when do we have to wrap up uh, with the questions? Um, I'll give you uh, 10 minutes. How about that? Okay. All right. That's, Sounds okay. good. More or less. All right. So if a SketchUp model, James is asking, if a SketchUp model is properly geolocated in SketchUp, will Artlantis recognize that? Normally, Artlantis will pull in uh, the cameras and the lighting uh, from most 3D modeling software, I believe that SketchUp is on that list and, and that those settings will be retained, although it's been a while since I've looked at that issue specifically. If you're having problems with that, by all means, contact Advent Support. We're here for you. I happen to work for Advent Support, uh, so I'm one of the people who reads through the tickets and answers them. And uh, so if you're not getting a desired outcome, uh, uh, you know, give us a shout. So just go to artlantis.com. Go to, go to the support section um, and then you know answer or ask your question and we'll be happy to answer it. So if you're not getting the desired outcome there or things aren't coming over from SketchUp and you think they should be, uh, for example, if you're using the SketchUp export plugin, you've got SketchUp Pro, um, then uh, you know uh, drop us a line. Uh, next question: Are there any specific numerical inputs, input combinations for the various parameters? that make great rendered visuals or has one or does one have to keep tweaking to find out what works best for each project? Um, I, you know, I'd say you gotta think like a photographer mostly in Artlantis or like an illustrator. Uh, Artlantis is an artist tool as much as it is actually more than it is an architectural tool. Uh, so from that standpoint, I think it encourages experimentation. That's why there are sliders and not just numerical boxes where you input things because it's so much easier to grab a slider and tweak and play and see the uh, instant feedback happening in the 3D preview window. Uh, <clears throat> and that's what's going to, you know, I think that's what makes Artlantis fun and what gives you the ability to, you know, get these kind of results where you're getting these effects um, happening in an animation. And, you know, is getting that real-time feedback, playing with those sliders and seeing, you know, putting Artlantis through the paces and seeing what it can do. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Um, James, well, I don't know how many questions, but James has a lot of questions in here. I'll keep going with James, though. Can you please explain the section icon shown in the bottom right area of the 2D view dialog in the parallel mode? Um, uh, let's see if we can stick to lighting questions. Uh, where is a good place to grab HDRIs? Uh, one would be HDRI Hub. Uh, if you do a Google search for HDRI Hub, um, I know that's, I think, the, I think that the HDRIs I used in this presentation came from there. Uh, I know I got maybe 10 or 12 samples from them. I know Josh Design <coughs> sell uh, some HDR images. Really, I mean, uh, for things like textures, things like 3D models, things like HDRI, you can, you can pretty much Google this stuff. Artlantis works with just, as far as I know, any HDRI image. So you can find freebies using Google if you use the right keyword search, or if you want to buy some quality stuff, you're not happy with what you're finding out there that's free, um, then uh, I think Arca Radar is, uh, is an Italian website, arcaradar.com. IT, which might have some HDRIs. There's a lot of them out there, though. Um, Gideon asks, does Artlantis have preset settings for renderings, just like in V-Ray? Uh, there are presets for um, some of the things in Artlantis. Uh, for example, when I was going through the um, 
physical camera settings. There's just a couple set up for sort of a basic interior and a basic exterior. Uh, and then you're going to pretty much tweak them from there. Uh, same with the, the non-physical camera. Uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of presets set up for interior lighting and exterior lighting that are going to kind of change the, the bounce values uh, or the ISO values. Uh, and those are really just reference starting points. From there, you are really, you know, you, you, you've got to kind of experiment. And really, every view is going to be different. It's like when you walk in with a camera in a room, you can't just automatically know what your setting is going to be. You're going to have an idea, but you aren't going to actually know. You've got to use your light reader. You've got to look through the lens. You've got to get the feedback on screen and see what the light levels are, are and that sort of thing. Use your eyes. Uh, and you also just kind of have to know, you know, and that comes through experience what settings work best. And once you do it, and we've done it a few times, you're going to know, you know what, what you like and what you like best. Uh, but you're still going to get into situations where, you know, okay, I've got 50 lights in this room. Uh, I'm probably going to be using a diff slightly different setting than I would if I only had four light sources set up in the room. So it is going to vary some. Uh, so you always have to be willing to experiment, too. Uh, James has another question. It would be great to access this file for user familiarization. This file, I think, is actually the Art Menace 4 demo file, and you can uh, you can download the Art Menace 4 demo installer on artmenace.com in the download section. So if you want this project, just go ahead and do that, and uh, install Art Menace demo, which will install you know, Art Menace itself, but it also includes a folder with some scene samples. So this, I believe, came from that folder <clears throat> and uh, so you can you can find it there and use it. Uh, any idea when IES light data files will be available in Artlantis? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I know it's been discussed. Uh, I, whether or not it's actually going to happen, I don't know, and I certainly don't know when or, or if it will either. I wish I, could, wish I had a better answer. Um, Sophia asks, uh, I would like to know what is the main difference between Artlantis and SolidWorks? Why would I choose Artlantis over SolidWorks? Um, I don't really know much about SolidWorks, so I don't think I'm really a, the person qualified to answer that. Uh, I will say this, though. Artlantis is available, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, as a free download. Um, you can run the full version for 30 days on a limited uh, basis, a 30-day limited basis. Have access to all the features create real projects with it. If you decide you like Artmanis and you want to purchase it, you can activate the demo with a serial number that will be sent when you purchase Artmanis. And you can continue working on the projects that you had set up in the demo version. So um, I would suggest you know, downloading the demo, putting it through the paces, block out some time so you have some you know, adequate, sufficient time to use Artmanis, and see what it's like. And then do the comparison. If SolidWorks has a demo, download that, try it out. Uh, don't be afraid to call um, your local reseller, Novedge, ask them questions. If they can't answer it, they'll kick it back to me. I'd be happy to sit, you know, sit on the phone with you and talk about any questions you have. I, I, even though I'm, I'm not really involved in the sales side anymore, I'm happy to help with pre-sales questions uh, to help get you up and running, get you on your feet, and help you get the most out of your demo experience. You know, I, I want to see you succeed in art manners. So um, hopefully that kind of kind of answers your question. Um, <clears throat> Deary asks, for attenuation slider, if I make it more, what happens? Uh, well, more, I'm assuming you mean that you're adding a higher value, so you're increasing the distance used for attenuation. So if the, the more distance you add in that attenuation value, uh, the more the dimmer the lights become. It has a dimming effect on the lights. So that, simply put, is what attenuation does. Um, next question. Can you animate lights changing color and turning lights on and off? Absolutely. Those are... Uh, in, I, we didn't really touch base on this, but in the animation <coughs> settings in Artlantis, if you switch to animation, you've got this timeline. Um, and you can pull that timeline up and get a listing of all the different animated attributes. But basically, you can animate a whole lot. Uh, I'm not going to answer the question of what you can an uh, animate and what you can't. Uh, that is in the help 
document, which you can pull up here in the Help menu. Uh, and it's got a full listing of the things that can be animated and the things that cannot be animated near the end of the manual. So just do a keyword search for that, and you'll find that information uh, pretty handily. But yes, most of, most of the uh, lighting parameters, uh, certainly color, uh, whether the light's on and off, position of the light. Uh, you know, you saw in the animation I did of the Eiffel Tower, I had a spinning or rotating light at the top of the tower. So those sorts of things can be animated. Um, I'll go back and take one or two more questions here. I have a problem about the ground line turned black. How can I fix this? Sorry, I know it is far from our subject. Uh, yeah, it is. And, and again, I would point you to uh, Artlanta support on artlantis.com. Create a support ticket there. And one of the support technicians will be happy to assist you with that question. Uh, next question. We have the 2D people coming as shaders. They are okay with Art Manus 4, but not with Art Manus 5. Is this a glitch with Art Manus 5? Uh, it could be. It could be a permissions issue uh, with your user account. Uh, if it is a permissions issue, um, there might be a fix for it depending on what your operating system is. Uh, that would be a question for the support team, so I would recommend again submitting a support ticket on artmanus.com and someone will help you with that question. Um, uh, Chris? You bought them. Yes. Oh, nothing. Just uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so there was a follow-up question. I'll, I'll I'll answer that, and then and then that'll be it. The follow-up question uh, to that question was: They bought them from from Dosh Design. That changes the equation a little bit. Uh, the answer to that is they may not work well, and an app that really isn't in a position to support third-party products um, in our um we of course do support the products we sell, which there's a, a huge uh, collection of uh, shaders available in the media library in Artlantis. Um, but for those types of things, you might want to co contact Dosh Design directly and see if they have an answer for you before contacting the Artlantis support team. All right, so uh, sorry to cut you off. Um, you no, saying? thank you, Chris. Uh, no, I, uh, <laughs> we have a time issue. So um, I don't know how sure. many questions were left out, but maybe we can uh, answer them in a Novaj blog post and uh, I think there are only four questions left. Okay. Would so you, do you I, think you want me to take them now or, or answer them in the blog? Um, up to you. Um, did you take? Can, you can you do it? Can you do it? I can and, probably uh, do it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, so DRE asks, how could HDR file be adjusted according to its height? Um, again, if you go into the um, background setting. Um, we need to be in a uh, perspective view. Click on that. Set up a. An, actually, I'll just go to one that is using an HDR a camera that's using an HDR right here, and then go into the HDR. So um, play with these values here. X is going to offset. You know the X distance. Y is going to offset the horizontal. So if you enter some numbers in there, you're going to see what the effect is, and you either need to increase the number or, or go negative to decrease it. That's how you can tweak that. Next question, what hardware would you recommend for working in Artlantis? Uh, and you mean the video adapter. Um, those kind of things are on the artlantis.com websites. I think they might also be in the help menu. So if you've got the demo version and you're evaluating Artlantis, um, look to those two areas for an answer to that question. Uh, you could you know, set up a support ticket if you wanted to. Uh, on artmanus.com. You can't find that answer easily, but I know that information is on artmanus.com on the website, uh, and it'll tell you what the minimum requirements are and what the recommended requirements are. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> how to be fixed according to the camera view. I'm not quite sure what that means. Oh, um, I guess that's going back to the question on the HDR. How can it be adjusted according to its height, and how can it be fixed according to the camera view? Uh, Again, you just each camera can have its own independent settings. Basically, all the settings that appear in the gray bar at the top um, related to, to you know, Heliodon. If you set up a Heliodon and then you assign that Heliodon to a camera, um, then uh, those settings are going to apply to that camera. So if you're in the camera itself and you're going into the background and setting up an HDRI, then uh, that's going to that HDRI is going to be specific just to that camera you're working with. 
Uh, so hopefully that answers the question for you. And then the last question, uh, oh, I guess this is a follow-up from Ivan. Uh, so what hardware can you recommend for Arclanus? Um, and you mean video adapter, not render, but working process. So you're probably talking about video card and that sort of thing that's going to uh, give you the best performance for your uh, 3D preview. Um, I think that's using OpenGL, so you're going to want uh, you know, something with OpenGL acceleration. I'm pretty sure that's still true. Uh, again, I would, uh, it's probably better to defer that question or to look up that information. In the forum, that, that information gets discussed pretty frequently, so there might even be threads in the ArtManus forum, which again, you can access from artmanus.com. Uh, so you might actually start there in looking up that question, uh, but also look for, look at the system recommendations on artmanus.com as well. I know that information might be covered. Um, or you can ask that question again in the tech support forum and somebody will answer that. I don't, you know, I don't know. I would have to look that information up to be able to answer that question um, and check with one of the experts in Paris who knows that information like the back of their hand. So that is all the questions. I'm, I'm amazed that I got through them all, but um, thank you, everyone, for your attention. I appreciate your time today and for hanging with me a little bit after our deadline, and, and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, what you saw today. Uh, that was great, Chris. You got great feedback throughout the presentation, so uh, that's fantastic. And I thank you so much for taking your time, extra time, to answer as many questions as possible. So I'm going to um, make myself uh, a presenter again, yeah. um, so you'll be able to see my screen again. Yep. Yeah. Let's see. Is that what's happening? Do you see yes. my screen? Yes, I do. Okay, let's see. Do you see? All right, but it's not, for some reason, it's not full screen. Do you see full screen? No. No. Ah. Okay, let's see. I don't know why something's happening. All right, I'm sorry about this. Uh, all right, now. Okay, um, thank you so much, Chris, for this fantastic presentation, a very illuminating, pun intended. And um, um, I wanted to say that um, uh, thank you also from the Nanobyte team for attending. And uh, sorry, I have to go this way. If you want to check out Nanobyte, come visit us at www.novage.com where you can also find this great promotion where you can upgrade to uh, Atlantis 5 with a great offer. So uh, really, it's really convenient to go from 1 to 3 all the way to 5 if you are um, an already uh, Atlantis user. So uh, this, solid, this offer is valid till uh, this Sunday. Take advantage. And also subscribe to our Novej blog, but also to our webinars, because uh, you can really uh, get all the uh, updates and uh, all on the future webinars and uh, the future Hangout that we have. Uh, our series is, you know, rolling every week, so you don't want to miss any one of our fantastic webinars. If you uh, also hang out on social media, like us on Facebook, Google+, Plus, Twitter, we are all over. Coming up next week, uh, a fantastic webinar from one of our favorite uh, instructors, Maya Mera Holson, uh, with a killer combo. She will demonstrate how to model a full-face motorcycle helmet with Rhino 5, and afterwards, she will use V-Rain to um, render it. So don't miss it. Last but not least, today's presentation is free and is being recorded live. Uh, it should be available as soon as this afternoon on our Vimeo channel and YouTube and uh, you can watch it over again and uh, somebody was asking because they wanted to share it with their colleagues. So um, yeah, it's there for you whenever you need it. Thank you so much, Chris, and uh, I hope to see you in a future episode. Um, this collaboration is great. Uh, you are also one of our favorites, uh, not to play favorites, but um, this tutorial was great. Um, it's always thank a you. pleasure working with you. Okay, always, so... As always. Yeah, thank you, and goodbye, everybody. Uh, see you in the, another 
Knowledge webinar um, as soon as you know possible. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Chris.